and I am director of the Center for Jewish Studies at Eastern Michigan University. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's presentation by Dr. Catherine Kangany, Reams of Hate, the Legacy of Henry Ford's anti-Semitic newspaper. Before the lecture commences, I want to tell you a bit about EMU Center for Jewish Studies. The CJS offers classes in Jewish life and culture to EMU students, both on campus and on the road, in places as far away as Germany, Poland, Spain, and Israel. We sponsor faculty and student research, and we are responsible for this lecture series. Our next event, a conversation with Representative Alyssa Slotkin, will take place at 7.30, please note the difference, it's at 7.30 p.m. on Thursday, October 14. And it will be both in person in the EMU Student Center Auditorium and on Zoom. We'd also like you to celebrate Hanukkah with us this year, slightly belatedly, on December 8th at 7 o'clock p.m. in the Student Center Auditorium again with Donnie Zasloff and Eric Lindbergh, leaders of the band Nefesh Mountain, who will discuss Jews, bluegrass, and other American musics, a conversation with some songs about tradition and they are both going to chat and play. These events are free and open to the public, so mark your calendars. None of this is possible without help from our friends in the community. And if you'd like to contribute to our vitally important work, please look to the Eastern Michigan University Center for Jewish Studies page on the EMU website or our page on Facebook. And if you have any questions, you can contact me at jewish.studies at emish.edu. If you have questions or comments about tonight's talk, please include them in the Q&A portion of Zoom, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. We will try to honor as many of these as time permits after Dr. Kangany has finished. This evening's talk is part of the College of Arts and Sciences Detroit Theme Year, a year-long series of presentations and performances and exhibits exploring the Motor City. You can find the Theme Year schedule, and it's got a lot of very exciting stuff, at tiny.emish.edu slash Detroit. Introducing tonight's speaker is EMU history student, Katie Tinkstad. Ms. Tinkstad, a four-time Dean's List member, is recipient of EMU's Emerald Scholarship, a Michigan Competitive Scholarship, and most important for this evening, a Center for Jewish Studies Learner Family Scholarship, endowed by Professor Jeffrey L. Bernstein of the Department of Political Science, and named in memory of his grandparents, Yetta and Sal Lerner, and his mother, Eileen Lerner Zirin. Through EMU's study abroad program, Ms. Tinkstadt has traveled to Berlin, Germany, where she studied intensive German and took classes on the history of European diplomacy and Jewish life in Central Europe. Her senior thesis is titled, Hitler's Private Office is Decorated, with a large picture of Henry Ford, anti-Semitism and the response of Jewish people in Michigan. It considers the actions of Jewish Michigan, that Jewish Michiganders took in relation to Henry Ford's newspapers. And I think you can see why we chose it. Ms. Katie Tinkstad. All right, thank you for the introduction. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Katherine Kangany. Dr. Kangany received her PhD in history from the University of Michigan and was an associate professor of history at the University of Notre Dame. 
Dr. Kangany is the current executive director of the Jewish Historical Society of Michigan, a nonprofit educational society that aims to preserve and highlight the stories of Jewish Michiganders. She has made guest appearances on podcasts and television and has presented her work on Detroiters at numerous conferences. Dr. Kangany has even taken her work across the ocean where she gave her lectures in Germany. Dr. Kangany has a highly decorated service to the profession of history and currently serves as a reviewer for the William and Mary Quarterly, is a consultant for the Greater West Bloomfield Historical Society, and a historian for the Detroit 1701 Trail Project. She has also won the Outstanding Printed Periodical Award from the Historical Society of Michigan for the last two years, congratulations. And today, Dr. Kangany is with us to discuss the legacy of automobile magnate Henry Ford's anti-Semitic newspaper. So without further ado, I will pass things over to Dr. Kangany. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Uh, and, and thank you, Marty, also to you. I'm delighted to be here with all of you this evening. Shana Tova to you all. So um, I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. Going on 103 years ago, Automotive pioneer Henry Ford purchased his hometown newspaper, the Dearborn Independent. Sorry, one moment here. We're having trouble with the uh, slideshow. I'm going to try this again. There we are. So 103 years ago, automotive pioneer Henry Ford purchased his hometown newspaper, the Dearborn Independent. The paper had been established 18 years earlier in 1901 as the fourth of Dearborn's newspapers. And in its earliest iteration, the Independent was typical of small town weekly publications. But at the end of 1918, Henry Ford began to signal his interest in acquiring it and turning it into something else entirely. He announced, quote, I am very much interested in the future, not only of my own country, but of the whole world. And I have definite ideas and ideals that I believe are practical for the good of all. And I intend giving them to the public without having them garbled, distorted, or misrepresented. Ford pledged the modern day equivalent of $10 million to finance the dissemination of his definite ideas and ideals. And that intention was reinforced by the newspaper's new name, the Ford International Weekly, and you'll see that in the slides ahead. But I show you this cover from 1926 now, so you can see the kind of old-timey, rural, Yankee fantasy life uh, that Ford was trying to peddle in the paper. Um, note, note the tagline there, New England House by the Roadside. N notice also, also at the bottom, Chronicler of the Neglected Truth. Publication under Ford's name began in January 1919. Despite its mundane name and its wholesome images, the independent belied a sinister purpose. Acquired on the heels of World War I and amidst heavy migration of Jews escaping Europe and settling in the United States, the Ford International Weekly became the mouthpiece for Henry Ford's anti-Semitism. In 1919, he told the New York World, international financiers are behind all war. They are what are called international Jews, German Jews, French Jews, English Jews, American Jews. I believe that in all those countries except our own, the Jewish financier is supreme. Here, the Jew is a threat. We'll come back to that. The newspaper's initial staff included Marcus Woodruff, previous owner of The Independent, whom Ford retained, business manager Fred Black, and writer William J. Cameron, formerly of the Detroit News, and you see him pictured here with Ford. For his editor, Ford hired E.G. Pip, who had previously edited the Detroit News, and you see Pip on the far right on this slide. So seasoned newsmen. Ford regularly hired Jewish laborers across his enterprises, but he ensured that all the newspaper office employees were non-Jews. And critically, he expected them to share his opinions, but not all of them did. As the independent's true purpose became clear, E.G. Pip, the editor, left the paper in April 1920, just before the anti-Semitic articles ramped up. He went on to publish a scathing indictment of Ford in 1922 called The Real Henry Ford. And you can see a copy of the book on the upper left there. 
Note the tagline, Henry Ford as I know him, and I know him. The book included a chapter entitled, An Eye-Opener as to the Jews. What is the explanation of Ford's attitude toward the Jews, Pip asked. Why did he attack them in the first place? His answer, quote, there is no question that Ford figured with only 3% of the population Jews and 97% Gentiles, he could gain two votes for every one he lost by attacking the Jews. The votes piece is key. Pip maintained that Ford had his eye on the presidency. Note the campaign hopeful button in the lower left. The anti-Semitism Liebold, and Liebold had also arranged for Ford's acquisition of the paper. Pip called Liebold a Jew baiter who helped fan the flame of prejudice against the Jews in Ford's mind. And you can see Liebold in the back road there with the fedora. And to make this point, um, it's worth outlining, outlining how the Independence articles came to fruition. As we'll see, Ford would later and vociferously claim not to have written them. And technically, in the sense that he was not at the typewriter or arranging the type, this was true, but he was behind them all the same. He conveyed his ideas and ideals verbally to Liebold and to writer William J. Cameron, who was promoted to editor upon Pip's resignation. And Cameron, initially reluctantly, but soon with gusto, then developed Ford's ideas into article form. Liebold then dredged up the supporting material, both from print sources and also from the detective agency that he ran out of New York City to investigate the private lives of prominent Jewish Americans. So these three men reinforced and emboldened one another's anti-Semitism. But at bottom, these were Ford's ideas and ideals. As Professor David Bosworth has insisted, quote, let there be no mistake. Despite Ford's later attempts to deflect blame by pretending he was unaware of its content, the campaign against Jewish people was both initiated on his orders and a true reflection of his bigoted thinking. Or as Leo M. Franklin, rabbi of Detroit's Temple Bethel, put it in his unpublished memoir, was Ford shrewd enough to build up an unparalleled industrial empire and yet blind to what was happening right before his eyes? The newspaper was, by design, Ford's personal propaganda organ, and this went on literally for years. In 91 issues spanning 1919 to 1927, the independent trucked in tired but resonant stereotypes, blaming the world's ills from capitalism to warfare on Jewish people. And I want to give you a sense of how these um, articles, especially their headlines, appeared on the page so that you can see their visual power. And let me tell you that if you keyword search digital copies of the Airborne, uh, Dearborn Independent for Jew and Jewish, you get truly hundreds and hundreds of hits. And I read them, so you don't have to, you're welcome. Uh, but I've put together a, a representative sampling of what's out there. And I wanna begin with the issue that prompted E.G. Pip to resign. The lead story of the May 22nd, 1920 issue was entitled, the International Jew, the World's Problem. The subheadings on the right capture the particular problems the paper wished to highlight. Plutocracy impossible under Moses's law, the Jews' belief in a superior nation, world's gold center followed the Jews, the Jew and his dealings with governments, reasons the Jew has for claiming superiority, Europe watches and warns America. This initial foray into anti-Semitism soon became the independence calling card. Note the lead stories on these three covers from 1921. The peril of baseball, too much Jew. Are the Jews victims or persecutors? Is Einstein a plagiarist? And in all caps, Jew admits Bolshevism. I also bring you an assortment of headlines, also from 1920 and 1921. And as I read them around, aloud, you might look for common themes, topics, stereotypes, placement in the paper, common words and phrases, and so on. Jews attack Christians. Jew wires direct Tammany's Gentile puppets. Uh, Tammany Hall was the Democratic Party's political machine, 
that controlled politics in New York. So the, the implication here, because it was a, a heavily Irish Catholic institution, is that Jews were behind it and, and um, finagling politics in New York. Jew York always gets money. Benedict Arnold, his Jewish aides, angles of Jewish influence in American life, the Jewish demand for rights in America, Jew trade links with world revolutionaries. Does Jewish power control the world press? Will Jewish Zionism bring Armageddon? The Jews' complaint against Americanism, gravity of a Jewish Negro alliance, the scope of Jewish dictatorship in the US, Jewish jazz moron music becomes our national music, allied with the movies and spreading degenerate ideas. You get the idea. So we might note that anti-Semitism was present in every issue of The Independent. It often was included in a headline on the front page. Page eight was devoted entirely to anti-Semitic content. We also might note recurring words among those headlines that we just looked at. Power, control, influence, attack, rights, money, Americanism. We might also note particular fears of control, of uh, Jewish control of banking, of the economy, of politics, war, culture, press, uh, higher education, Christianity, and unions. Fears of modernism, uh, especially in popular culture, jazz, movies. You might think about this in contrast to those old-timey newspaper covers we looked at, even Greenfield Village itself, a fanciful past that Ford romanticized. Fears of alliances, um, Jewish alliances with Black Americans, Jews' racial or religious loyalty over political loyalty to the United States, to Zionism, European revolutionaries, especially radical Marxists. And I would also point out here that the Independent and Ford himself cycled between targeting all Jewish people and targeting specifically American Jews and targeting, targeting uh, European, Eastern European Jews. But we'll see that over time, the paper and Ford began to distinguish between assimilated, acculturated German-American Jews who were perceived as less threatening and unassimilated Eastern European Jews who were perceived as more threatening. So there's an interesting tension uh, in the independent in between painting Jewish people as powerful enemies while also denigrating them as unthreatening others. And this, of course, is a very old tactic for neutralizing, quote unquote, threats. You might also have noticed that the material in those headlines was drawn heavily from uh, a source known as the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. And if you're not familiar with this, uh, with this document, I'll just give you a quick introduction to it. It was first published in Russia in 1903. Uh, the first US edition in English hit, hit the United States in 1920. And, and 1920 is critical. We'll come back to that. Um, but the, the protocols were purportedly the minutes of a secret meeting outlining how Jewish people were going to take over the world. And it soon became evidence for the Jewish presence at the root of all of the world's problems. In reality, of course, this was a plagiarized forgery, which had been debunked numerous times. The document has its roots in an 1864 French satire criticizing the reign of Napoleon III. And that satire had absolutely nothing to do with Jews or Judaism whatsoever. But a Russian forger took this French satire and essentially did a hack job find and replace in it, substituting references to Napoleon III with Jews. So the protocols are a notorious forgery and they've been debunked numerous times. And yet, as we'll see, they persist today. And much of that persistence is thanks to Henry Ford. The Independent published excerpts and commentary on the protocols beginning in 1920, so the same year they first reached the United States. And you can see this headline at the top of the screen there, um, that this 1920 issue of the Independent was meant to be a kind of primer or introduction to the protocols content. So the newspaper was designed to provide the proof that the plot outlined in the protocols was coming true. And this was the news in 1920. It was meant to prey on Anglo-Saxon Protestants' prejudices and fears. And the independence endorsement and popularization of them is the reason that the protocols live on even today. Here's what Henry Ford had to say about, say about the protocols. Quote, the only statement I care to make about the protocols is that they fit in with what is going on. 
They are 16 years old, so his math is a little off there, uh, and they have fitted the world situation up to this time. So that's Ford's endorsement right there. The protocols are genuine. And the consequence of the protocols is this, that anti-Semitism, which once had been a largely Christian phenomenon, now became a global phenomenon, including in places that had no Jews. And to make this point, I want you to pay attention to the number of times these sources use the word international, and you'll see what I mean. Ford, of course, was not the only public figure who used his platform to perpetuate the protocols. In 1923, they were given to Adolf Hitler, and they soon became part of Nazi ideology. And in fact, Hitler came to admire Ford's role in distributing and popularizing anti-Semitism. And in 1925, Ford was mentioned by name in the second edition of Hitler's manifesto, Mein Kampf. Uh, and this is what Hitler had to say about him, quote, only a single great man, Ford to Jews' fury, still maintains full independence from the controlling masters of the producers in a nation of 120 million, end quote. Hitler wished to send his shock troops to America to help Ford get elected president. Although the protocols added a new international dimension to anti-Semitism, from the perspective of the anti-Semitic language and tropes that had been circulating through North America in the preceding centuries, this particular variety of hate speech in the independent was largely unoriginal and commonplace. And that was precisely the point. If, as E.G. Pip claimed, Ford's motives were heavily political, he was counting on the familiarity and the acceptability of his vitriol. He wanted it to confirm readers' ugliest convictions. He wanted it to ring true. But he wanted the scale of that fear not to be on national, but international proportions. And so to reach an even wider audience than his newspaper, the most aggressive and inflammatory of the Independence articles were compiled into a four volume set known as the Independent, excuse me, as the International Jew. And this is an image of the first edition cover of the first volume published in 1920, subtitled The World's Foremost Problem. And again, you can see the influence of the protocols here if you look through the chapter uh, titles that are listed below and its preoccupation on globalism you'll see that they're drawn directly from those headlines that we looked at a few minutes ago. And in the years that followed, in the two years that followed, the newspaper's masterminds published three additional volumes. Volume two, Jewish activities in the United States. Volume three, Jewish influence in American life. Volume four, aspects of Jewish power in the United States. And again, you can see that these themes or topics are not far off from what we noted in our sampling of headlines. Again, not groundbreaking, calculatedly familiar. So let's talk about the harm caused by the international Jew. And here I wanna to turn to the words of Rabbi Leo M. Franklin who witnessed this damage firsthand. The four volumes of the international Jew he wrote in his unpublished manuscript, quote, were distributed in translation into many languages in every part of the world. This was grist for the anti-Semites mills and they made good use of it. In Germany in particular, the book was quoted again and again by those who sought to annihilate the Jewish people. And Hitler himself, it is said, regarded it as highly as an instrument of propagating his vile doctrine as he did his own book, Mein Kampf. It was widely advertised and distributed in anti-Semitic meetings everywhere, alike in this country and abroad. And even after Mr. Ford's retraction and his repeated promises to see to it that the <coughs> book destroyed, we'll talk more about that part of the story in a minute, its distribution continued in Germany, in Italy, and particularly in South America. And that list doesn't even do justice to the international range of publications. And you'll get a better sense of that from a 1927 advertisement praising Henry Ford's 1922 book, My Life and Work, which included plenty of anti-Semitic material like this. Quote, for the present then, the question is wholly in the Jews' hands. If they are as wise as they claim to be, they will labor to make Jews American instead of laboring to make America Jewish. The genius of the United States of America is Christian in the broadest sense, and its destiny is to remain Christian. But let's get back to that 1927 advertisement. It marvels, my life and work, quote, has been translated into Dutch, Finnish, German, Italian, Polish, Russian, Swedish, Czechoslovakian, Danish, Norwegian, French, Hungarian, Japanese, Spanish, and Arabic, 
and it is estimated that 2 million copies have already been sold. And that's just sales. We also need to talk about the power of donations. The National Director of the Anti-Defamation League wrote to Rabbi Franklin sometime after his appointment in 1931, concerned about the ubiquity of the international Jew. At the Springfield, Ohio Public Library, he noted, was a copy donated with the publisher's compliments. He worried that this might be the case, quote, in many other libraries of the country. And it was. Copies had been sent to libraries everywhere. And yet, even Gutstadt was in utter disbelief that Ford could intentionally foment what he called injustice to our people. He wrote, quote, it appears to me if it were brought to his attention, Mr. Ford would attempt to recall or have destroyed all of these sets presently extant. He pressed Franklin, urging his involvement. What do you think about the possibility of discussing the matter with Mr. Ford? If the independence ideas were mostly old, the scope was unprecedented. The independent thrived because of Henry Ford, the man, both his business acumen and celebrity. The newspaper's printing press operated out of Dearborn's Ford and Son tractor plant. And here's a photo of it in situ. The splashing of Ford's name across the masthead ensured that newspapers far outside Southeastern Michigan and even the United States reported on and reprinted the articles. Stacks of issues, along with 500,000 bound copies of the International Jew, were shipped to Ford dealerships across the country. They were even slipped inside newly purchased vehicles as they were driven off the dealer's lots. The dealers had been ordered by Fred Ford's general sales manager to push subscriptions, just like any other, in his words, standard Ford product. Some dealers sent free subscriptions to family, friends, and names picked out of the phone book. Most simply factored the subscription fee into the price of a Model T, giving all of their Ford buyers an automatic subscription. When one Virginia dealer lamented to Ford that his Jewish landlord was threatening him with eviction over the articles, Ford's secretary and closest aide, Ernest Liebold, wrote back, does it not appear to you that a Ford agent should own his own building to place him beyond the exertion of such pressure? He reminded the dealer, quote, Jews will endeavor to make victims of our agents whenever possible. Thanks to aggressive tactics like these, the independent circulation, 700,000 copies per week in 1924, was second only to the New York Daily News. How about other technology? During the following decade, in the 1930s, the independence articles were also disseminated by radio, particularly by Charles Coughlin, Catholic priest at the National Shrine of the Little Flower in Royal Oak, Michigan. Coughlin was known for his pro-fascist and anti-Semitic rhetoric, what he called social justice. And he had an estimated audience of 30 million listeners tuning in to his weekly broadcasts. Two of his standard themes will be familiar to us now as students of the protocol, the role of Jewish bankers in supposedly fomenting the Russian Revolution, and the heavy representation of Jews among Russian revolutionaries. Both of these themes, of course, we know to be false. Um, but in the second half of 1938, Coughlin was pushing both of these ideas, and he began to republish portions of the protocols in his own magazine, which he also called Social Justice, despite the fact that by this time, the protocols had been thoroughly and repeatedly denounced a fake for going on 20 years. Here's what Coughlin had to say about the protocols. Quote, yes, the Jews have always claimed that the protocols were forgeries, but I prefer the words of Henry Ford, who said, the best truth of the protocols is the fact that up to the present minute they have been carried out. Well, it's not quite what, what Ford said, but nonetheless, the point, the point stands. Mr. Ford did retract his accusations against the Jews, but neither Mr. Ford nor I will retract the statement that many of the events predicted in the protocols have come to pass. The amplification of the Dearborn Independence audience set Southeastern Michigan and the country ablaze. As one modern day person has put it, quote, the atmosphere of panic that the radio priest engendered in the Jewish community of Detroit provided the context for my childhood. That apprehension colors my generation's response to words and incidents that were still to occur until the present day. So Coughlin's hate speech, rooted in Ford's hate speech, has enduring consequences. But let's step back in time. As perhaps the most prominent rabbi in the same metropolitan area as Coughlin, 
Leo M. Franklin received mail from across the country, apprising him of local applications of Coughlin's rhetoric and begging for his intervention. S.H. Livingston from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, wrote him to say, quote, since Father Coughlin says Jews are communists, I've been digging into the matter to see how communistic I am and whether Catholics have any communistic taint on them. In Philadelphia, a Protestant minister writing in the Philadelphia Inquirer said it was not the duty of a Jew to save a non-Jew who fell into the sea because the Jew did not consider the Gentile a neighbor. I may be wrong, but I have a habit of getting after these men. I think the Jews have been too passive and that Americans do not like a people who lack guts. I'm not looking for trouble, but it seems to me I have a right to fight back and contradict unfair remarks. Warner Brothers screenwriter Norman Bernstein seemed to encourage Franklin to help uncover Coughlin's bankrollers as a way to shut down his platform. F.G. Kopak of Boston put it more bluntly, quote, many people would like to know whether the rumor that Henry Ford money is backing for the Father Coughlin is founded on fact or hearsay. And Francis Cousins of Detroit implored Franklin, quote, as the leader of the Jewish people in this city, we appeal to you to do all in your power to get some action from Coughlin's superior Archbishop Edward Mooney in stopping the activities of this enemy of democracy and free thought in America. One Rufus Apollo, a professed former Catholic, urged Franklin to fight fire with fire, stopping Coughlin with his own radio show. Apollo boasted, quote, I've already outlined the program, including announcements, music, your speech, plans for advertising, and plans for writing, printing, and distributing the pamphlet that would be drawn from your broadcast. All Franklin had to do was say the word, which apparently he didn't, but he kept Apollo's proposal all the same. Not all of Franklin's Coughlin-related correspondence was fan mail. One person from Buffalo, New York, who signed his name as America for Americans, lambasted the rabbi in late 1938, quote, I cannot recall a time when I regretted spending three cents to write a hypocrite. You of all the un-American rats, you should call Father Coughlin un-American. For your information, we do not need a Coughlin to tell us who the communists are. We who can read it all know well who they are. To me, and I am confident millions just like me, Coughlin overshadows you as an American. If you call yourself an American, well, so is Hitler. And in my opinion, you two are equals. Let's leave America for Americans and keep the undesirables out of this country. Jews for the Ford plant, ha ha, that's a joke. When everyone knows a Jew will not work in industry or till soil. Did you ever hear of a Jew farmer? Here's for keeping all the Jews out of this country or face the same issues that face Europe today. Would you try to make anyone believe that the Jew is persecuted for no reason at all just because they're Jews? We can see in this short letter all the strands of the protocols Ford, Coughlin, the role of technology, and the power of hate all coming together. And except for a couple of period references, this is rhetoric and fear-mongering and hate speech that feel contemporary. As Franklin's correspondence reveals, it's not simply that the independence hate speech went viral. This isn't simply about dissemination. It's also about sanction, license. Henry Ford's name, his newspaper, his own words encouraged hate. And as Franklin put it, quote, the perverted thinking of Henry Ford and the distribution of the writings that went out in his name in many lands and many languages, and we might add here in many different mediums, were to say the least a factor that served to encourage the enemies of the Jew in their unspeakable vicious crusade against him. And those encouraged enemies included Hitler himself. Franklin noted, quote, let no one believe that Adolf Hitler's anti-Semitic sentiments and those others who were created in his image were not encouraged and intensified by the backing they felt they had for their anti-Semitic sentiments from America's greatest industrialist. And now for a sidebar. When he was last in the US, I had a conversation with historian Robert Rockaway, who's a scholar of 20th century Jewish America, about the enormous popularity of his courses on Jewish gangsters, which he teaches at Tel Aviv University. Why, I asked, are students from Israel, the United States, even China, so captivated by these stories? Because, he replied, it was a time when Jews stood up to evil. And although that answer may not be wholly satisfying, after all, gangsters are pretty ruthless opportunists themselves, I do think Rockaway is onto something, and we can make a similar argument here. It was a time Jews stood up to evil, but with a significant difference. 
The story we usually tell about the independent is about what was done to Jewish people. We often leave out the most critical part, which is how Jewish people fought back and ultimately in that moment prevailed. And so that's what I'd like to turn to talking about now. We're gonna discuss four strategies that the Jewish community used to hit back at Henry Ford. And some forms of resistance you may have heard about, um, the Anti-Defamation League, of which Rabbi Franklin was a founder, organized boycotts of Ford products. And many Jewish people, as well as liberal Christians, participated in that economic resistance, refusing to buy Ford. Most famous was Rabbi Franklin himself, who refused the complimentary automobiles that he had been accustomed to receiving from Ford. Ford, of course, was at a loss to understand Franklin's decision. He wasn't disparaging acculturated German Jews like Franklin, only immigrant and international Jews. Just as Franklin was at a loss to understand why his neighbor, generous to Detroit's Jewish community, suddenly spewed such venom against Jewish people, calling it, quote, a bolt out of the blue. So that story is well known around here, but you may be less familiar with the actions of Ford dealers who were also Jewish. One Ford employee recalled the many Jewish dealers who refused to peddle Ford's hate. Instead of distributing the copies of the Independent and the International Jew that they were given, they threw them in the trash without even untying the bundles. So lots of people in the community resisted in various ways, but I wanna focus on some of the most high profile and best documented forms of resistance. And I wanna begin with back channel diplomacy. In response to the Dearborn Independent's first two issues, New York attorney and public servant Louis Marshall, who was then serving as the president and strategist of the American Jewish Council, filed off a personal telegram to Henry Ford, shaming him for, quote, disseminating anti-Semitism in its most insidious and pernicious form. The newspaper's palpable fabrications, he railed, are the emanations of hatred and prejudice. They constitute a libel upon an entire people who had hoped that at least in America they might be spared the insult, the humiliation, and the obloquy of this mischief-breeding sheet. He beseeched Ford, on behalf of my brethren, I ask you whether these offensive articles have your sanction, whether further publications of this nature are to be continued, and whether you shall remain silent when your failure to disavow them will be regarded as an endorsement of them by the general public. Three million of deeply wounded Americans are waiting your answer. The point is, Marshall started privately, giving Ford the benefit of the doubt and a chance to recant. Two days later, Marshall received the following reply from the Dearborn Publishing Company. Quote, we regret the words in which you have seen fit to characterize the Dearborn Independent Articles. Your terms insidious, fabrications, insinuation, pernicious, hatred, prejudice, libel, insult, humiliation, obloquy, mischief making, we resent and deny. Your rhetoric is that of a Bolshevik orator. You mistake our intention. You misrepresent the tone of our articles. You evidently much mistake the persons whom you are addressing. Incidentally, you cruelly overwork your most useful term, which is anti Semitism. These articles shall continue, and we hope you will continue to read them. And when you have attained a more tolerable state of mind, we shall be glad to discuss them with you. And this is how Marshall responded on the same day. Your telegram in answer to my personal message to Henry Ford has just been received, from which I infer your answer is authorized by him and betokens the sanction of the articles in the Dearborn Independent, to which I have taken exception in words that I shall be able to justify. So he was telling the Independent that he was moving to phase two, public pressure. Not everyone was happy with Marshall's explosive approach. With his soft touch, Rabbi Franklin had been on the verge of convincing Ford to agree at least to a partial retraction of the article. But Marshall's angry telegram only sealed Ford, who vowed to keep printing. And so Franklin turned to Henry Ford's son, Edsel, who was by then serving as president of Ford Motor Company to help talk some sense into his father. Edsel Ford had a reputation for being fair, often for holding differing views from his father. And so on June 29th, 1920, Edsel Ford assured Franklin that he would, quote, be very glad to deliver to my father the letter attached to yours of June 28th, although it does not seem to have prompted Henry Ford to any positive action. But lawsuits filed by prominent Jewish Americans were a different story, and that's the fourth strategy the Jewish community used to fight the paper. 
In response to Henry Ford's dissemination of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion and 500,000 copies of the International Jew, a journalist and activist by the name of Herman Bernstein published his own book called History of a Lie to unmask the protocols as a plagiarized forgery. Perhaps in retaliation, in the August 21st, 1921 issue of The Independent, Henry Ford identified Bernstein as the, his, as the source of his conspiracy theories undergirding the entire newspaper. Ford preposterously claimed that Bernstein, quote, told me most of the things I had printed, calling Bernstein the messenger boy of international Jewry. Bernstein vehemently denied the allegations, suing Ford in 1923 for $200,000 and telling the media that Americans had to have a true picture of Ford's diseased imagination. Although Bernstein was represented by Louis Marshall's law firm, the lawsuit languished because Henry Ford's cronies ensured that he would not serve the suit's subpoenas, and so he could not be compelled to take the stand. But finally, in 1927, Ford agreed to pay all of Bernstein's legal expenses if he simply dropped the lawsuit. Bernstein agreed to such a flimsy settlement because by this time, a much bigger and more impactful lawsuit accomplished exactly what he wanted. In April, 1924, San Francisco attorney and farm cooperative activist, Aaron Sapiro became enraged over the international Jew, which accused Jewish bankers, lawyers, advertising agencies, fruit farmers, market buyers, and office professionals of scheming to control America's farm cooperatives. The international Jew called out Sapiro by name for his undue influence over America's produce system. In reality, Sapiro had been working to protect American farmers through internal price controls and collective advertising to help eliminate middlemen and bring more profits to the producers. Sapiro sued Ford, not the newspaper, not the Dearborn Publishing Company, Ford, because he claimed that as owner, Henry Ford had final say over the paper's contents. He sued Ford for defamation of character for $1 million, a princely sum that was meant to capture the media's attention, and it did. Although both Ernest Liebold and William J. Cameron took the stand, swearing Ford had no knowledge of the Independence articles, as an investigative journalist by the name of Max Wallace noted, quote, whatever credibility this absurd claim may have had was soon undermined when James M. Miller, a former Dearborn Independent employee, swore under oath that Ford had told him he intended to expose Sapiro, end quote. Even Ernest Liebold admitted the truth when he was no longer on the stand. Quote, Mr. Ford knew everything that was going on. There was no one who could get by with putting anything over Mr. Ford, such as conducting a campaign against the Jews. As long as Mr. Ford wanted it done, it was done. Preliminary legal proceedings in the Sapiro suit dragged on for two years. Finally, the case came to trial in Detroit in March, 1927. The trial's pinnacle was supposed to have been the testimony of Henry Ford himself, who had been subpoenaed by Sapiro. But to get out of his legal obligations, Ford staged a car accident. He drove himself into a ditch and he was rushed to, you guessed it, Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit for treatment. Even though Ford was only mildly bruised and in no way unfit to take the stand, his attending physician told the reporter that it was the shock of the mishap that really mattered. Eventually, the judge would declare a mistrial. But before that second trial could begin, Ford's representatives worked out a deal. In exchange for Ford paying all of Sapiro's and Bernstein's legal expenses, publicly repenting, and formally abolishing the Dearborn Independent, Sapiro would drop the suit. Sapiro agreed. And why did Ford suddenly have this change of heart? Because the Jewish community's boycott of his cars had substantially pinched his sales. Ford was counseled that his proposed launch of the new Model A would end in failure unless he ended his anti-Semitic campaign. And so he did. Now we get to the really interesting part. Ford's camp then secretly made contact with Louis Marshall and asked for Marshall's help in crafting on Ford's behalf a letter of apology and retraction that Ford would then sign. Imagine for a moment how crazy this must have been. Ford's emissaries went to the most prominent Jewish American attorney in the United States and asked him to craft the apology. Marshall complied and he sent Ford a draft that unbelievably Ford accepted without change. Ford then had one of his assistants sign on his behalf, you can guess where this is going, and release it to the public. 
I want to give you some pertinent excerpts from Henry Ford's apology and retraction. Quote, although both publications are my property, in the multitude of my activities, it has been impossible for me to devote personal attention to their management or to keep informed as to their contents. This therefore inevitably followed that these publications had to be delegated to men whom I placed in charge of them and upon whom I relied implicitly. I frankly confess that I've been greatly shocked as a result of my study and examination of the articles. I deem it to be my duty as an honorable man to make amends for the wrong done to the Jews as fellow men and brothers by asking their forgiveness for the harm that I have unintentionally committed by retracting, so far as it lies within my power, the offensive charges laid at their door by these publications and by giving them the unqualified assurance that henceforth they may look to me for friendship and goodwill. The pamphlets which have been distributed throughout the country and in foreign lands will be withdrawn from circulation. In every way possible, I will make it known they have my unqualified disapproval and that henceforth the Dearborn Independent will be conducted under such auspices that articles reflecting upon the Jews will never again appear in its columns. The retraction had mixed results. Many questioned Ford's sincerity. After all, he simply redirected the blame to his subordinates sidestepped legal consequences, and most damningly, refused to sell his printing press. In fact, he continued to distribute the Dearborn Independence articles after Louis Marshall died in 1929. But for others in the Jewish community, Ford's retraction did bring some catharsis and closure. As Marshall himself wrote when he publicly forgave Ford, quote, for 20 centuries, we Jews have been accustomed to forgive insults and injuries, persecution and intolerance, hoping that we might behold a day when brotherhood and goodwill would be universal. And as one historian has calculated, four-fifths of the hundreds of letters addressed to Ford in July 1927 were from Jewish Americans. And almost without exception, they praised the industrial. So much so that even Louis Marshall expressed his amazement at the willingness of some of his co-religionists to forgive. As he put it, quote, to declare a Mordechai someone who only last week was regarded as a Haman. So references there to the hero and the villain of the Purim story in the book of Esther. But the point is the community changed its mind about Ford and was optimistic that Ford truly was a changed man. And what of Louis Marshall's own role in this denouement? Well, it continues to be debated and it continues to be controversial. Did he act in the Jewish community's best interest or was he himself manipulated by Ford? As one author has put it, quote, it's easy to believe that Marshall had honest intentions in hoping to end this ugly episode for everyone's benefit in a dignified and magnanimous way. And yet, it's clear that Marshall helped Ford uh, off the hook, helped him avoid a retrial, helped him restore his public image, and presumed to know what the, com the community's best interests were. So in short, it's complicated. But I think the takeaway is this. We see in this entire episode the nature of the obstacles that Marshall and American Jews faced in dealing with someone as powerful and wily as Henry Ford. And that certainly goes for Rabbi Franklin, too. Um, on the left is a 1938 photo of Ford trying to look chummy with Franklin with this caption, quote, Henry Ford, motor magnet, who in 1927 was sued for a million dollars for an alleged libel in an anti-Jewish campaign conducted by a paper he formerly owned. You can see already how Ford's role is being minimized here. Is shown here, right, as he discussed with Rabbi Leo M. Franklin of Temple Beth El, Detroit, the current German refugee problem. Ford blasted the German wave of anti-Semitism as, quote, the work of a few war makers at the top and said that his, in his opinion, the German people were not in sympathy with it. The motor magnet also said that the United States, quote, could absorb many of the victims of oppression who must find a refuge in foreign lands. Quote. Those admitted to the U.S., quote, would constitute a real asset to our country, he said. The auto tycoon insisted that his acceptance of a German decoration, let me pause here and say that Ford was awarded the Grand Cross of the Supreme Order of the German Eagle, which represented Hitler's personal admiration of him earlier that same year, quote, did not involve any sympathy on my part with Nazism. 
This newspaper coverage in 1938 came out because Ford had asked Franklin's help in crafting and disseminating a message to the local papers. And its purpose was to try to downplay Ford's acceptance of that Nazi medal by declaring that Ford wished to hire displaced European Jews. Franklin accepted Ford's request for the same reasons that Marshall did, to try to broker peace and foster reconciliation, and of, of course, to offer employment to refugees. And interestingly, when Father Coughlin read Ford's statement in the paper, he publicly questioned its authenticity. And yet, despite the insistence, despite the contrition, as we know, Ford resumed publishing and disseminating the international Jew. He claimed that his signature on the 1927 retraction was forged and was not something he had agreed to. He hung on to his printing press. He cozied up to Nazis. He would go on to rail against Jewish bankers, blaming them for having caused World War II. He died in 1947, unrepentant. And even today, the international Jew, like the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, remains in print. You can even buy baffling branded merchandise like this shower curtain, featuring the front page of the June 11th, 1921 issue of The Independent, and it can be yours for the low, low price of $75. So where does all of this leave us? Well, most notably, Henry Ford's grandson, Henry Ford II, also known as Hank the Deuce, we know was a strong Zionist. He became president of Ford Motor Company in 1945. And shortly after Israel's independence in 1948, the year after his grandfather died, Henry Ford II oversaw a trade deal that shipped automotive parts to Israel to help alleviate its transportation crisis. The following year, he personally gave Israeli Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion a new Lincoln Continental. He donated to Jewish causes, including the United Jewish Appeal and the Israeli Emergency Fund. He created a Ford Escort plant in northern Israel, telling the press, quote, I don't mind saying I was influenced in part by the fact that the company still suffers from a resentment against the anti-Semitism of the distant past. We want to overcome that. Wasn't quite the distant past, of course, but the point was good, and the desire to make amends continued. As the ADL notes, quote, in the decades following Ford's death in 1947, the Ford family and Ford Motor Company have engaged in numerous projects and endeavors in the public interest, including many that have been supportive of Jewish concern. As one example, in 1997, the Ford Motor Company sponsored the first screening of Steven Spielberg's film Schindler's List, commercial free on national network television. But there's still work to be done. In December, Bill Ford, the current executive chairman of Ford Motor Company, gave a New York Times interview. And the interview asked if, in this larger moment of racial, of racial reckoning in the United States, how he and the company have addressed Henry Ford's anti Semitism. And this is Bill Ford's reply Quote, Do you feel compelled to make up for everything your great grandparents did? What's important is how we're acting today. So is it something I'm aware of? Yeah, absolutely, as part of my family's history. But is it something that I feel lingers today? No, I don't, not in the least. And I wanna make sure there's no sign that it's ever coming back. Well, it is back, probably never was gone. Henry Ford's words are still used today. They're still commended and, and on a scale we've never seen before, giving them a power and a reach we've never seen before. As journalist Bill McGraw has shown in his award-winning coverage, the protocols and the extracts and the proofs that were printed in the International Jew routinely receive five-star reviews on Amazon.com. Although mercifully, the copies are a bit harder to find now than they were a few months ago, but they're still out there. Conspiracy theorists invoke the protocols to explain the 9-11 attacks. The organizers of the 2017 white nationalist rally in Charlottesville claim to have been motivated by them. There were even ties to the protocols and the hate signs on display during the Capitol riot in January. And in March, a copy of the protocols was left by a security guard at a checkpoint in the Capitol complex. But there are also much more insidious instances of its distribution. Matt Levine from the Michigan office of the ADL tells the story of having recently found a copy of both the International Jew and the Protocols of the Elders of Zion in the Judaica section of a pop-up used book sale. And although it's unclear if the sales organizers put them there out of knowledge or in ignorance, Matt purchased both of them simply to remove them from the shelves. And that's where we come in. 
giving, given the enduring power of these ideas and ideals, the role of new technologies like social media platforms in their amplified dis dis dissemination, whether that's Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, 8chan, Parler, Gab, MeWe, whatever, and in the varied places and forms we find them, this is our call to action. Let us follow the example of those activists who came before us. Let us become familiar with those words of hate so that we can call out that language when we see it and call it for what it is, hate speech that has no place in our society. Let us be the thunderous counter narrative that drowns it out and shuts it down. And let us also, especially in Southeastern Michigan, speak frankly about Henry Ford. Let us acknowledge deeply and openly as we have for Thomas Jefferson, the good and the bad that coexisted in this man. And let us resolve that we can no longer discuss one without the other, and that we cannot shy away from doing so, even when it makes us or others uncomfortable. Henry Ford is overdue for that reckoning, and our community should and must lead the way. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. We are going to be moving into our Q&A section. Uh, this is going to be some that have popped up in the chat. Uh, you are certainly not late, folks, if you have not dropped any questions yet. If now at the conclusion you have any things that you still have questions about or maybe questions if something wasn't talked about, feel free to drop that in the Q&A section right now and we will answer as many of those as we can. So you addressed this towards the end uh, briefly, but I think there is a little bit more room for discussion if you have any more information about kind of all of Ford's descendants and including maybe modern day Ford institutions. How have they continued to distance themselves from these views? Obviously the last quote you said was pretty, uh, not a great distancing quote, not a huge attempt to really say that we're working against it you know, pretty much a dismissal of the question. So is there any other things that have been said or done? Well, I just uh, just combed through the news again uh, today just to see if anything more recent has, has popped up since that uh, since that interview in December. And no, there, there hasn't been anything. And the, the, the kicker in that is that the journalist really handed Bill Ford uh, an opportunity. All he would have had to say, you know, in one sentence was, we, we condemn the, the hate speech by, uh, by Henry Ford and we, we do not tolerate it and we stand with those who stand against it. And that would have, that would have just you know, been such a red letter day for the Ford Motor Company. So, um, so yes, yeah, certainly Ford has, done, uh, has made various gestures and, uh, and done some things to try to overturn Henry Ford's um, hate speech in, in the intervening decades. But as we're seeing this hate speech, um, you know, go viral in a way that it didn't in the 1920s and 30s. I mean, uh, the scale today is unprecedented. Um, it's, it's not a one and done story, right? It's not a one and done opportunity. We, we addressed it then, we don't need to address it now. No, we all need to keep addressing it um, because it's just growing in visibility and, and power. So it, there's a real opportunity there for the Ford Motor Company and the Ford family. I, I certainly agree. It was definitely the uh, good moment to make a, a powerful statement and it was chosen to be ignored instead. So you have mentioned that, you know, a lot of this has carried into modern times. How are those patterns, those parallels between attacks that are, you know, now a hundred years old and how are they still so modern on like attacks on the cultural elite being uh, anti-Semitic remarks in that fashion? So, um, so to, to reiterate a point I, I made in the, in the course of the lecture, the, the reason that we are still dealing with the protocols of the elders of Zion in 2021 is because of Henry Ford. I mean, that's, that's it in a nutshell. Um, it was debunked numerous times before it even came to the United States in 1920. The purpose of the paper was to prove that the protocols were coming true, to introduce the masses to this document, to provide the evidence for it. Um, and that's, that's really the reason that we're still dealing with it today. You know, there were um, allusions to the protocols uh, in the Capitol riot in January. There, there have been allusions to it at other uh, assaults, uh, white supremacist assaults on, on the country. And so that I think is, is where we really see the power of Henry Ford's um, 
persona and his newspaper, that's where we see it um, because we're still having to deal with the protocols. And that is because of Henry Ford. Uh, we have a, another question that just came in. What was Ford's relationship with, say, other racial movements? You, you addressed it briefly <laughs> that, of course, uh, he likely took a, an unfavorable stance, but did he act in any you know, extreme ways against those other movements, or did he devote most of his time specifically to anti-Semitic movements? Yeah, well, he certainly wasn't very nice to the Black community. He wasn't very nice to the Mormon community. Uh, I noticed someone in the in the chat talking about uh, uh, Ford um, sending in his um, cronies to bust up um, union attempts. Yes, that's absolutely true also. So really, any population group that threatened his idea of this old-timey Yankee fantasy world, like, you know, which is Greenfield Village, right? That's, that, that is what he was going for, the fiddle music, the, you know, the colonial garb. Um, he made this, this documentary um, in the 1940s that was, that was <laughs> meant to characterize and, and um, show what his childhood had been like. And so he hired actors to dress up as the Ford family and there was a little boy playing Henry. Uh, and so they're walking around and, you know, milking cows and climbing over turnstile fences and whatnot. And that, that was the vision, right? That's what he wanted America to look like. And anyone who was not of that, you know, colonial stock uh, was was an interloper and someone some some group that needed to be dealt with. So I think that transitions us into a, a great question from the chat. Given in the last couple of years the actions to remove symbols of the Confederacy, you know, taking mm -hmm. down statues, changing building names, changing names on, for example, college campuses. What is your thoughts on doing similar things for Henry Ford, which, of course, those of us who are from this area can name countless things named after Henry Ford? So I am I am not in favor of cancel culture. Right? As a historian, I say cancel culture is very dangerous because once we decide we're not going to talk about it anymore, we're taking it down. It's going to be obliterated from, you know, from pop culture and the historical record then it really becomes dangerous because it, it goes underground and it gains more power. So the solution is not to obliterate Henry Ford. And Henry Ford's not going anywhere. And he shouldn't go anywhere. He, he, did, um, he did some really amazing things, right? He was a brilliant guy. Um, but we can't not talk about this side of him. Um, we can't shy away from it. We've got uh, we've to talk about it hand in hand. So I'm I, I don't know. I don't know if the solution is changing the names on buildings. It's it's certainly it's certainly broadcasting this other side of him um, and making sure that we're giving it equal weight in the conversation. So we don't cancel him, um, but we we illuminate, right? We shine the light, um, and and that's our responsibility to do. Um, we need to be that counter narrative. I think that's fantastic. Do you think that is? Uh, this is just a question I'm, I'm bringing for myself. Do you think that is happening enough with the current, like Henry Ford, I suppose campus, you could call it? Do you think that, you know, are there signs, informative, you know, boards that say in a building that is pretty much built to praise him, do you think there is enough of that effort? So I, I cannot speak for 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 the motor company now, um, and I and I know there are some uh, folks in the audience who are current employees, and so I would be um, I'd be curious to hear their their takes on that. Um, being insiders there, um, I will say that the that the Henry Ford Museum is grappling with this um, slowly, but they're grappling with it, and they're um, they're thinking about reworking the uh, Liberty and Justice for All exhibit, which is the one that uh, that that ends um, ends with the bus. And they're, they're thinking about having a tail, putting a tail on that exhibit to talk particularly about Henry Ford's anti-Semitism. And if that goes forward, that would be great. That is, that is a terrific step in the right direction. All right, I think we're probably gonna do just one or two more, not quite sure. Uh, sure. And I've seen a couple comments of this and some questions. So I think this might be an interesting one to end on. There's been some interest in this detective agency out of New York that you <laughs> mentioned. People are interested between that and the security arm of Henry Ford. Yeah. So if you want yeah. to go into a little and more it, details on that as our I mean, closer. Yeah, I mean, one one and the same, right? These these are part and parcel of the same um, same process, which is to intimidate, terrify, 
uh, whether whether that's in print or physically. So yeah, these these are these are part and parcel of the same process. Um, and the detective agency is where Liebold um, would would do the investigation, both you know intimidation and uh, and fabrication uh, of prominent Jewish Americans, so that so that he would then have the quote unquote evidence to back up whatever Henry Ford's idea for story was for that for that week. So um, a, a really terrifying process. Well, if you would like to leave us with any closing remarks, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Uh, I'm someone who has lived 15 minutes away from the Henry Ford Museum, gone all through my childhood, and there's so many things that we realize that we never know about. So thank you again so much, and please, anything else you would like to leave us with tonight? My pleasure. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here. This was a delight. And if there are any more questions out there, you can always get a hold of me at Jewish Historical Society. My email is first initial last name, C Kangany, C C A N G A N Y, at J H S Michigan.org. Uh Katie, I want to thank you so much for, for coming tonight and for, for talking about Henry Ford. It was a, a brilliant lecture, and, uh, and I, I know the audience uh, really, really appreciated it. I, I know I did. I want to wish everyone a very, very happy new year. Shana Tova. Uh, I want to thank um, our sponsors for the evening, and that is the Harold Grinspoon uh, Foundation, and uh, the gang at EMU Hillel, who I can never thank enough. I'd also like to thank our friends at the Jewish Historical Society of Michigan, uh, who, who, uh, who are, are just great folks and, and who, uh, who made Katie available for us this evening. And uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Uh, it, was, it was a great evening and uh, I'm deeply appreciative. Uh, please again, join us um, on October, um, 14th, Thursday, October 14th at 7.30 in the evening for Congresswoman uh, Alyssa Slotkin, and uh, which should be a, a great deal of, of fun and, and really exciting. And uh, I will see you then. Uh, again, the, this is the EMU Center for Jewish Studies. Please get in touch with us. Thank you. <laughs>